All right, you guys, Dave Man Max 6. We are back with our favorite doc, Dr. Ran. Thanks for having me again. Oh, thanks for having me, man. Glad <laughs> to be back. It's a beautiful day in Santa Monica. Perfect weather right now, and we have a bunch of uh, new questions. Uh, you're pretty excited about those questions, actually, you told me at lunch. <laughs> yeah, I got to look at these uh, prior to, and there's a couple good ones here. They're always good ones, but this one, particularly, uh, one of them I'm particularly passionate about. Nice. And um, also, you mentioned the weather. We're not wearing masks either. That's a nice, That's a nice little bonus. change. Yeah, <laughs> you're used to that where you're from now, but yeah. uh, I'm not. So, <laughs> All right, so we'll start with the first one. Let's go. Number one, I heard that growth hormone should always be used in conjunction with T4 thyroid medication. Is this true? And if so, why? Thanks. Can't say that it's true. Uh, we, I've, I did look up some studies. I'd never heard of this one before. And there are some small studies, all of which are conflicting. Uh, I guess I should just say that there's nothing conclusive that I can see because of the design of the study and because of the fact that they're very small. There are some consistencies though in that while T4 may decrease, the free T3 usually increases. So at the end of the day, free T3 is where the rubber meets the pavement. That's what controls what I refer to as your your, your idle speed. So do we want to add more T4? No, not necessarily. T4 is potentially free T3, but just because it drops uh, in relation to GH use doesn't mean that clearly it doesn't mean that your what, what's real to you the thyroid function is going to drop it actually goes the other way according to the majority of what I saw in studies that I would argue again even though there, there was one that was uh, randomized uh, double blind and placebo control but it was too small mm -hmm. but across the board T3 seemed to rise I should say across the board in most of them so no Bottom line, to answer the question, this will be a short one. Should you uh, use the T4 with your GH? No. Does it, does it does it affect, does growth hormone affect insulin as well? Because bodybuilders always used to say, whenever you do GH, your insulin should be, it should be supplemented with that also. Have you heard about that or no? There's a lot of interrelationship and it gets even more confusing because when GH is produced, it typically lasts 20 to 30 minutes in the circulation, it hits the liver at some point, and then the liver will typically make insulin-like growth factor, IGF-1, from that stimulation uh, by, by GH. And so that gets confusing because of the name. Insulin-like growth factor, though, is not insulin. Mm -hmm. In fact, insulin and GH are arguably um, competitive with one another. That's mm -hmm. one of the reasons why if you want your endogenous production of GH to rise, you definitely don't want to eat within you know two or three hours of bedtime. You don't want to spike your blood sugar because then the resulting spike in insulin will definitely compete. And I'm probably being uh, not generous enough. Uh, compete, it'll hammer your production of growth hormones. So when I see guys and gals come in with low IGF-1, which we use as a surrogate marker for GH because of what I just said, it's only in the system for a short period. And the IGF-1 has a much longer half-life. If I see a low IGF-1, I'll ask him, are you eating late at night within two or three hours of bedtime? Or even if it's you know outside the three hour mark, are you having a Jethro bowl of something, particularly a starchy carb or something that would spike your, your sugars and therefore your insulin? And of course, other things like uh, it's a peptide, so um, are, are you eating enough protein? But yeah, th that's the relationship between insulin and growth hormones. So Interesting. Um, okay. yeah, you, you definitely have to strike a balance there and be careful how you do so. Okay, great. Thanks, Doc. Next one, Doc. Question two, hello, I'm a senior in college. I am an amateur MMA fighter, a lifelong bodybuilder, and played competitive sports since I was a child. Sounds like you. <laughs> we didn't even have MMA back then. We called it something else. We did fight? fight. <laughs> Schoolyard uh, supremacy, yeah. Um, with that being said, I know my body and I know my body well. Upon starting finasteride a year ago, my nipples got puffier. Somewhat of a dis disfiguration, however. I'm almost certain it's not gyno, and if it was, then it would be an early stage. Strangely enough, it never seems to get any worse. I have yet to stop the finasteride because I want hair. I've tried to remove taste inhibitors, and they seem to normalize for a bit. I've tried running higher doses of Masteron during a test and mass cycle. They got better. Hmm. Well, I'm not sure I can speak to the Masteron part of that, but... 
if you're blocking the conversion from testosterone into dihydrotestosterone, which is what you're doing, blocking the enzyme that makes that conversion, 5-alpha reductase, then it's certainly conceivable that you'll have more testosterone to, to uh, become not DHT, but another hormone that you may not want too much of and it causes gynecomastia, estrogen. So that makes sense. So you, you've, you've stopped some of the conversion down one channel, and so you've got a backup, if you will, that can go down another channel. That, so that's, that, that seems uh, very plausible that that would happen. In terms of gyne true gynecomastia, gynecomastia is development of, of, of breast tissue. Okay, so it's going to be sort of rubbery in, in texture. I, I say this because some people come in and say, oh, I've got, uh, you know, I've got breast tissue here. No, you've just got fat there. And, and actually, breasts, female breasts, are largely made of fat, but the, the glandular tissue is more rubbery in texture and has a different function altogether, of course. And that's what really gets, uh, you know, we can grow that tissue, believe it or not, if we have enough estrogen on board. And I know this begs another question I think we're gonna get to, which I'm passionate about. Uh, and actually, I didn't finish reading this one, so let me just continue and we'll keep going. Um, but, but puffier, I mean, that could be from fat, that could be from water retention, it could be an area where you third space water more than others, everyone's individual in that regard. But, but true gynecomastia is gonna have that, that uh, uh, nodular rubbery texture and because uh, it's, it's glandular tissue that's growing. Um, so not sure that you're actually suffering from gyno, but again, that's plausible. And then um, uh, I've tried aromatase and never seemed to normalize for a bit. Yeah, that's, that's how you would stop that conversion. So then you're gonna keep more testosterone on board and it could convert to other things, you know, other androgens, for example. But, but you know, the two main categories we talk about are it's aromatization into estrogen and it's, um, uh, conversion to DHT through this 5-alpha reductase um, enzyme. Um, he says here, problem is I can't stay on AIs and juice long-term to combat some weird side effect from finasteride. I don't know why. Uh, in, in testosterone replacement therapy, we use uh, an astrozole, an AI, and aromatase inhibitor all the time. It's a great uh, tool, and it's, and it's easy to manage because as opposed to, for example, using a CIRM, a selective estrogen receptor modulator, where we're blocking the receptor, we can get assays of estrogen with a CIRM, but not know what they really mean because you're still having this production of estrogen from testosterone, but how much of it's being blocked, we don't know using the assay. With an aromatase inhibitor, what we read is what's floating around and that's not being blocked. So that's what you got that's real to you, again. So it's easy and, and with all the studies we have, using estrogen and, and, and of course also using aromatase inhibitors like eczema stain and anastrozole is one I, I look to just mainly because uh, anastrozole used to be the cheaper between the two so we just got used to using it or I did. Uh, but uh, again you can, you can actually measure the amount of estradiol sensitive and we use estradiol as a surrogate marker for all the estrogens and you know exactly what you're dealing with and you can correlate it with symptoms and signs. Again, whereas with a CIRM where you're just blocking the receptor, it's, it's total guesswork, if you will, clinical uh, guesswork or, or based upon clinical signs and symptoms. So, uh, and we use the, the AI indefinitely because it's safe. Yeah. And, and, and I know there's a lot of controversy about this, AIs, can do this, that, and the other. AIs themselves don't cause the problem, in my experience. Oversuppression of estrogen causes the problem. So you can have estrogen deficiency symptoms if you use AIs for, not necessarily for too long, you can use them indefinitely, but if you use them too much, meaning you, you, you have too high a dose, and you can suffer symptoms just like uh, estrogen deficiency in females, in a male, you can suffer from palpitations, um, you won't have vaginal dryness, but you'll have <laughs> hot flashes and night sweats, and um, the effect on the lipids is not also, this is just comes up a lot, so I'm gonna address it now, but AIs don't lower your HDL cholesterol. The reduction in estrogen, though, can have that effect. So again, it's from oversuppression of estrogen using an AI that you have the problem. So again, going back to this, you could be on, on an AI indefinitely, and um, it, it's a great way to manage estrogen in, in the TRT arena, we'll call it. 
Uh, sorry, I just lost the, uh, the note here. Uh, there it is. No, there's not. There it is. So he also asked, if I were to stop the finasteride for 30 days to see if my nips would go back to normal, is this going to result in accelerated hair loss considering I have now been on this for two years? Couldn't tell you that. Uh, depends upon your genetics. It depends upon how your hair follicles respond to dihydrotestosterone, at what level is too much, and what, at what level does it cause the inflammation that typically results in the, in the hair follicle being disturbed and, and at least temporary hair loss and then permanent uh, follicle damage. Uh, 30 days uh, of an effect on the, the gynecomastia, yeah, I mean, it, it, it could make a big difference. I would suggest um, what I did, which is to you know get the most, best of both worlds. If you're not having side effects of the finaster, I just asked, add the AI to it. Um, doesn't mention how old he is, but you'll know what your genetics are. First, you can look to your parents. They always say it's your mother's father that has the most influence genetically. Um, I think there's a little bit something to that, but I think it's still a little uh, naive. I think we found that just like with the eyes, you know, it's not just one gene that determines your eye color. There's at least four we've identified now. Ditto for, for hair loss, but there are some that are stronger than others. But uh, what I was getting at it with regard to age is look around at people that have started to lose their hair, right? We all know somebody who's who's got male pattern baldness. It usually starts somewhere in the late 20s and by the early 30s, you know, okay, I'm going to have male pattern baldness or not. So at that point, you can decide, well, do I even need finasteride? Um, and of course, there's hair thinning rather than male pattern baldness that can develop some more than others. So you can gauge your finasteride there. But in terms of governing the gynecomastia that he's calling it or the, the puffy nipples, um, uh, again, based upon what I'm saying here, uh, my suggestion would be not to keep going back and forth on meds. Uh, you're not really proving anything um, or you're not solving a problem. Try the AI and be comfortable with the fact that uh, you can stay on that indefinitely. Um, Good. Yeah. And as far, again, as far as the Mastron goes, um, I'm not sure how that would be helping the condition. It sounds like that's what he's saying, right? I've tried running higher doses of Mastron during a test and mass cycle, and they got better. He's not trying to say that. He is saying that. Yeah. I can't. Uh, I can't fathom why that would that would work better. But yeah. you know, I'll hit the books and see if I can figure that out and address it next time. All right. Thanks, Zach.